me in your Bibles to the book of Genesis at chapter 15. Brethren, can you turn that air condition off over my head? It's blowing my little sermon away, and I need you to, to turn it off before somebody is unemployed. Genesis at chapter 15, commencing in verse number 7. And he said unto them, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me an heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he took unto, them, unto him all these, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one against another, but the birds he divided not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, an horror of great darkness fell upon him. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark. Behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land, from the river of Egypt unto the river the great Euphrates, the Kenites and the Kenizzites and the Cadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Raphaims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. Thank you. You may be seated. I can pronounce those words. <laughs> the grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our God shall stand forever. I want to continue in our series, Walking with God by Faith. If we are maturing in the Lord, growing up in the Lord, the faith that you have this morning ought to be stronger than the faith you had when you first believed. To wait a very long time emerges as an overriding theme in this chapter and indeed as a theme throughout the Abrahamic tradition. Abraham is 75 when he receives the promise but God does not bring it to fulfillment until he's 99. He has to wait 24 years before God keeps the promise. Now in the Promethean way of how we live our lives, and those of us who, who took eighth grade English will know that Prometheus was a titan in Greek mythology. He was a titan of the gods of Greek mythology. And uh, it was Prometheus, according to Greek mythology, who brought fire to humans. He took fire from the gods and gave it to the humans. And for that reason, he was punished by Zeus, the father of gods. But Prometheus is known for his forethinking. He always wants to know ahead of time what's going to happen. Uh, in our Promethean way of always wanting to know ahead of time, we always want to know before we move. We want to know before we act. But God is not on Instagram. Uh, uh, 
God does not tweet out what he's about to do in our lives. Uh, if you're going to have faith in God, you got to learn how to wait. Uh, we are not accustomed to waiting. Uh, it, we, we go to a fast food restaurant. And I never understood why they call it fast food and you got to wait 30 minutes. Uh, but, but we don't want to wait for anything. We want our coffee instantly. Uh, we want instant oatmeal and instant grits, uh, instant relationships, uh, instant everything. Everything has to be fast. Everything has to be quick. But God don't care nothing about your schedule. Uh, God is not bothered by your impatience. Uh, God moves according to his own time schedule and he does not have to sync his time with yours or mine. Hear me, brothers and sisters. Gifts that come from God cannot be forced. Uh, futures stay in the hand of the God who gives them to all of those who are patient enough to wait for it. In walking with God by faith, uh, like Abraham, we come to discover that God is to us what we need at the moment. Uh, whether it be comfort or whether it be wisdom or whether it be guidance or whether it be strength, God's gifts take on the shape of our necessity. Let me say that one more time. God's gift takes on the shape of our necessity. Whatever you need right now, God becomes that right now. I am that I am. That I am that I am means I am whatever you need in the moment. Whatever you need right now, I'm that. If you need something an hour later, I'm that. If you need something two months later, I'm that. If you need something 25 years later, I'm that. What I needed God to be in my 20s, I need something else in my 60s. I wish I had somebody who's been walking with the Lord a while. Uh, you can help me testify that when you were young, you asked God for small stuff. But now that you've matured in your faith and, and you're getting older, you need some bigger things from God. You need God to prop you up. You need God to be company for you because now your folks are dying and leaving you and now you're the last one left in your family. You need God now to be something else for you. He's a very present help in the time of trouble. As we consider what the Lord is doing in the life of Abram in this passage, let us consider, brothers and sisters, that God wants you to grow as a Christian. He wants us to mature. He wants to mature us, to grow us day by day, step by step, minute by minute. If you are not growing, you're not walking. If you're not maturing in your faith, if you're still at the same level of faith that you were at 15 years ago, you are not growing. I want you to see in verse 7 and 8 that Abraham has some concerns. Look with me in the text. And he said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give ye this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it. That's a, that's a concern. Abram has a concern. God, uh, God opens this section with a reminder to Abram and to us of who he is and what he is doing. He reminds Abram and us of his person. Uh, he refers to himself in verse 7 as Jehovah the I am, the self-existent one. Uh, he was here before anything and he will be here after everything and he controls all things that happen in between. 
Before there was a when or a where, a was or a will be, God says, in the midst of that, I am. There was never a time when God was. God is eternally am. I wish I had somebody to help me here. God never had a beginning or an end. God is never scratching his head wondering how the future is going to work out. God has already lived in your tomorrow. What you have to meet tomorrow is not going to surprise God. God is from everlasting to everlasting. He's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the first and the last. There is no beginning of his person. He is the eternal I am. God not only reminds Abram of his person, but he reminds him of his power. Uh, look in the verse again. He said, I am the Lord that brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees. He reminds Abram that where he is now is because of God's power. It is all God and not you. Let me remind you, Lily Grove, where you are right now, God brought you. I need somebody to help me preach. It was not because you own a business. It's not because you went to college. It's not because you come from a good family. It's not because you have a decent background. You are where you are by the power of God. Because if God took his hands off you, you'd be in hell this morning. If God just lowered, he don't have to move the hedge. If he just lowered the hedge, you'd lose everything you have. That's why you ought not ever come in church with a haughty look on your face. With a proud look on your face. As if God ought to be glad you showed up. No, you ought to be glad he woke you up this morning. I wish I had one or two more witnesses. You, you ought to come in here with your face humbled and turn towards the ground saying, Lord, thank you that you didn't kill me in my sinfulness. All my help comes from the Lord. All I need, God has supplied. Everything that has come my way has come because of the power of God. He reminds him of his person. I am the God who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees. And then he reminds Abram of his plan. He said, I'm going to bring you to inherit this land. God brought him out to bring him in. I need, a, I need a shouter right here. He brought him out to bring him in. He brought him out to bring him in. Sometimes God's got to take you away from what you think you need to bring you into what he had planned for you all along. I know Jeremiah said, the plans that I have for you. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a future and a hope. You, you got to be willing to get up from where you are to go to where God is trying to bring you. God is trying to give you more and you're trying to settle for less. Uh. I don't, I don't like diet drinks. I want a real Coke. I want all the calories that come along with it. I, I, want, I, want, I want to get as fat as I want to get. Talk back to me if you can. I, I don't, when I go to McDonald's, I don't ask for no lean hamburger. I, I, want, I want the fat running all down the side of it. 
Somebody ought to help me talk it. I ain't trying to be cute. I ain't trying to be lean. I want everything coming to me. I don't like Diet Sprite. I don't like Miller Lite. Am I talking to somebody in here? I, I want everything. I want all the everything I'm supposed to have. And I don't want God to give me grace light. I don't want mercy light. I don't want joy light. I don't want peace light. Everything God has for me, I want it. And if you don't want it, give it to me. This joy that I have, the world didn't give it. And the world can't take it away. I want you to see something. I want you to see something in verse number 8. In verse number 8, Abram has left his home. He's left his family. He's left the land he was raised in. He's left everything that he knew that was familiar to follow God on a promise. He does not even have it yet. And it'll be 24 years before he gets it. And so having left all that he knew, he raises in verse 8 a question. He says, Lord, I hear what you're saying. And, and, and I already told you in verse 6 that I believe. You. And you've already accounted what I believe as righteousness. But when I'm going to get it? Now, it's easy to take Abram's question to be an expression of doubt. But his question, watch this, is not doubt, but uneasy faith. Can I work on that a minute? He's merely asking God for more information. Now there is a difference between doubt and uneasy faith. God is too wise a father not to know the difference between the tone of confidence and unbelief. However alike confidence and unbelief may sound, God knows the difference. He's, listen, he is too patient to be angry if we can't understand all his promises at once. I'm trying to help somebody this morning. He is too patient to be angry if we can't take it all in at one time. What God is trying to do in your life is too big for you to understand it all at one time. And so if you're honest this morning, sometimes your faith is uneasy. Let me see if I can talk to you from the scripture. This nobleman came to Jesus and said, I need you to heal my son. I heard what you can do. I'm a man in authority just like you are. I know that you don't even have to come under my roof. All you need to do is say the word and my servant can be healed. I wish I had a Bible reader. And then Jesus said, do you believe I can do it? The man said, Lord, I believe. But I need you to help my unbelief. I wish I had a witness. Lord, I trust you, but I'm not always sure. Lord, I believe your promises, but people laughing at me because I don't have it yet. Lord, I know you're able, but I need you to give me some more information. You still not convinced? 
Peter came walking on the water at 4 o'clock in the morning because Jesus was on the water and Peter figured it was safer on the water with Jesus than in the boat without him. So he said, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come on the water also. And when we read that, we usually look askance at Peter because who else would be walking on the water at 4 o'clock in the morning? What Peter is really saying is, Lord, you sure I can do that? Jesus said, come. And when Peter got out of the boat, he actually walked on water. And he would have kept on walking if he hadn't taken his eyes off Jesus. But even taking his eyes off Jesus, he said, Lord, save me. And he went, when he began to sink, Jesus saved him because he said, Peter, I know you don't have enough information. And this morning, you might be trying to make a difficult decision to move your faith life forward. Just don't believe that God can do it. Watch him do it. You still not convinced? They told Thomas that Jesus was risen indeed. But Thomas wasn't there when Jesus came through the door. And Thomas said, I'm not going to believe. I, I know, I know y'all know what you're talking about, but I need to see it for myself. I will not believe until I put my finger in the print of the nails. Somebody ought to help me preach it. Now, Thomas is always called Doubting Thomas. He's not Doubting Thomas. He's Unsure Thomas. Because if I'm going to lay my life down for somebody, I got to be sure it's the right somebody. You still not convinced? John the Baptist sent his disciples to Jesus. He said, are you the one? Or should we look for another? Jesus said, go tell John the blind see, the lame are walking, the deaf are hearing again. And after Jesus gave him that reassurance, John didn't need any more convincing. John did not doubt Jesus, he just wasn't sure. And brothers and sisters, all of us, if we will be honest, at some time in our faith walk, we've been trusting, but tiptoeing. Trusting, but not sure. Trusting, but just, just, just like a child who's learning how to walk. They, they, they stand up and get their balance. And often they fall down until they get it right. And when your faith is like the faith of a child, often you fall down. But now you ought not fall down when you've been walking to God with God 30 years. Some things you just ought to know. I know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. I know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved, I have another building. I know in whom I have believed and that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him. That's some things I shout about because I know. I, I need some mature Christian in here. When the time comes to help some immature Christian some Christian who is not quite sure to learn how to shout with you when you don't have it in your hand. It takes a certain level of maturity to trust God when you can't see it. It takes a certain level of depth and roots of faith to be able to believe God when it's not apparently visible. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that are not seen. Uh, hear me, brothers and sisters. Uh, God, in this passage, is saying to Abram that he's not bothered by uneasy faith. What bothers God 
according to the book of James, is doubt. James says in chapter 1, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth or does not chastise him because he asks. And it shall be given him. But, but let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea tossed with the wind. And listen to me, to, to, for, for us to trust God and to let God move in our lives when we don't understand, if we doubt him, James says, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Abram questioned in verse number eight, not because he doubted, but because he was unsure. And unsure, uneasy faith brings concern to the one who has it. But then in verses nine through 11, God challenges Abram's faith. Abram has some concerns in verse seven and eight, but in verses nine, 10 and 11, God says, now I want you to meet this challenge because in order for my promise to be fulfilled, you got to do something. You see how quiet you got right there? Because you think it's all on God. And God got to do everything. God got to prove himself to me. Uh, God got to show me. Well, God said, all right, I'm going to show you. But I need you to do something. And that's where we fall short when it comes to faith. We don't want to do anything. Come to church and sit down every Sunday and don't do anything. Well, not every Sunday. You come once or twice a month. And uh, then when you come, you watch me preach. You watch the choir sing. You watch the ushers usher. You watch the deacons pray. You never do anything. You go out from this place feeling good, but you don't do anything. You don't even work in church. Matter of fact, that, that, that's foreign to you. That's a language you don't understand because you don't have time for that. Uh, your time is precious. And I can't be running back and forth with this church on no Tuesday for Bible study and Thursday for no ushers and, and Friday for no choir rehearsal. Uh, I've got children who are in sports activities and I've got things that, that need to happen at my house. When am I going to get a chance to rest? I mean, I've got to take care of myself. And the Lord understands if I don't take care of myself, nobody else will. I got to watch out for myself. I'm tired. I work all the week long. I cook for my family. I wash. I got to fold clothes. I, I got to clean everything in this house. Then I got to get in all this traffic on 45 and 59 and 610. And then I need some leisure time. I mean, when am I going to have some time for myself? I need to enjoy myself. I don't feel like cooking all the time. I got to go out some days. And then I got to try to get home because I got to get up and get to work the next morning. And then Saturdays is the only time I have time to vacuum and and, and, and strip my beds and, and take care of all the stuff in my house. I love a clean house. I can't stand no dirty house. I've got to have everything just right. I've got to put my forks right there, my spoons right there, my knives right there. And by the time I get through with all that, all I can do is go to church and go home. And if God and Reverend Addison don't like that, but who gives you strength to do anything? Let me challenge you this morning like God challenged Abram. Abram said, Lord, I want to I wanna know when you're going to fulfill your promise. But hear me, brothers and sisters, preachers, deacons, members, hear me. The great things of God do not come easily. They do not come cheap, nor do they come to lazy people. God's best is reserved for those who are willing to pay the price. They don't come easily, they don't come cheaply, and they don't come to people who are lazy. Listen, 
God told Abram, I don't need you to prepare something. It's right here in the text. He said, take a heifer of three years old, a she-goat of three years old, a ram of three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now watch this. Every time God required a sacrifice, it was an animal of a year old. But the animals in this sacrifice are three years old. Meaning that they are not young fatlings. It's not a young kid or a young lamb or a young calf. It's an animal that's strong and been working. And God told Abram, struggle with it and cut it in half. Wish I had one or two more witnesses. He couldn't struggle with a kid or a calf or a young lamb because they were a year old and weak and he could handle that. God said, get something that you got to struggle with and then cut it in half. It took all day for him to wrestle with a heifer three years old. It took all day to wrestle with a ram three years old. These animals are in their full strength. And he told Abram, cut them in pieces and put the pieces against one another. That was hard, all day, sweat, blood, toil and watch this after all that work Abram did to cut these animals in half the scripture says when he got through the vultures came and brothers and sisters hear me when promise is about to be birthed in your life when possibility is about to come forth in your life, get ready, the vultures are coming. But you got to do what Abram did in the text. In the text, the Bible says, when the vultures came, he shooed them away. And there's some folk in your life, you got to tell them, shoo. Scat! Scram! Get out! Move! I can't go where I'm going with you on my back. You gotta, you gotta get rid of these hangers on. You got to get rid of these people who are dragging along with you because they want to be where you are. They, they, they want to be big because you big. They haven't done anything. They just want to hang around with you after you've done all the work. You cut all the animals. You, you made all the sacrifices. You, you've done everything required for you to get your hands on God's blessing. And then somebody who just dropped in here last month trying to get in with you? Shoo! Get those people, those things out of your life. Hmm. Preacher, all the work you've done to become a preacher, all the study you've done, all the years of, of giving God your life, and now some armor barrel want to come along. I don't need you to carry my coat. I carry my own coat. You, you wasn't carrying my coat when I wasn't past the Lily Grove. All this hard work I've done, now you want to drive me around. I'm going to drive myself around. I don't need you to come in the restroom with me to help me change clothes. No, I, 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 I ain't going to ever be that old. 
where I need no man to come in the restroom with me and, and help me to dress. I don't, I don't need nobody to, uh, I, I go to churches to preach and uh, as soon as I drive up, they, 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 the armor bearers, I guess the pastors, little guys who help him out, they just swarm my car like locusts. Pastor, can I help you with that? Pastor, you need some help with that? Help me with the car, no. <laughs> Leave me alone. Go sit down somewhere. I've done all this struggling and all this preparing. And sister, the same thing goes for you. You've done all this schooling and all this preparing and, and all of this struggling and you've made it, you're on your feet now. And some nigga will come with his clothes in a trash bag. Talking about he's going to move in with you? Are you out your mind? I wish I had two or three witnesses in here. You can do bad by yourself. You don't need a dog if you got to bark. All the sacrifices you made, Abram says when the vultures came, he had to get them out because God was about to birth possibility. It was not only work to cut them in half, but it was work to keep the vultures from what he had. And when he did it, brothers and sisters, it took for him patience. You got to be patient when you're waiting on possibility. You got to be patient when you're waiting on future. Because future and possibility doesn't just drop in your lap. It takes time to make a preacher. It takes time to make a strong disciple. It takes time to make a rich, strong follower of Jesus Christ. If, if you're going to walk with the Lord by faith, it's going to take time. You're going to fall down. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to do some stuff wrong. You're going to have some regrets. There will be some decisions you wish you hadn't made. There will be some roads you wish you hadn't traveled. But if you follow God by faith, your good days will outweigh your bad days. His last word, and I'm through. He says, cut these animals in half and let them face each other. He had pigeons and, and turtle doves, but they were too small to, to cut them in half. There are some things you ain't got no business being bothered with. Uh, throw, that, throw that pigeon on the ground. He, he, he's all right. Throw that little turtle dove on the ground. You don't need to cut him in half. Some things you don't need to spend a whole lot of time on. Some folk in your life are just pigeons and, 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 and turtle doves. You, you ain't got no business spending time cussing them out. That's a, that's a pigeon. Uh, what, what, what does an eagle look like fighting with a turtle dove? Talk back to me if you can. If you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, if you're up here in your faith and somebody's down there cussing you or behind you cussing you, what you look like punching down? No, no, you don't, you don't trip over what's behind you. You just keep moving forward. You just take that pigeon, take that turtle dove and put it on the ground because it ain't even worth the time for you to try to cut that in half. Leave that alone. Put that on the side. But he worked for this heifer, he worked for this ram, he worked for this goat, and he worked to move the vultures away. And God is getting ready to confirm what Abram has been concerned about. And to confirm what he has been concerned about, God is getting ready to do something. He says to Abram, now, now come here. And the same thing he did to Adam, to birth out of him Eve, he did to Abram to birth out of him possibility. He caused a deep sleep 
to come upon him. And God moved in the thick darkness. Get ready to shout. God can only give details in the dark. Because Abram being up and conscious couldn't handle what God is getting ready to do. If the sun was up, he couldn't handle what God is getting ready to do. So it's right here in the text. God says, cut these animals in half, and when the sun goes down, God says, I'm going to let you know that your seed will be a stranger in the land. You, they will serve for 400 years. The nation that they will serve, I will judge, and afterward they're going to come back to this land, and you can go to sleep in peace. You can die knowing that I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. And here's how you know. It got dark and the animals are in half and there is a passageway between the pieces. There's a passageway between the pieces. Now this is an ancient blood oath ritual that whenever two men got ready to make a covenant they would shed blood of an animal, walk through the pieces of that animal, and the symbolism was, if I don't keep my word, let what happened to this animal happen to me. It was a blood oath. It was a testimonial. It was a sign that if I violate my covenant, let this animal's being cut in half be what happened to me. But now God is getting ready to make a covenant. And he tells Abram to put the animals against one another so that they're facing each other. And what's going to pass through the animals is a smoking pot and a burning lamp. A smoking furnace and a burning lamp. Now this smoking furnace and burning lamp is a prophecy of how they're going to come out of Egypt. They're going into Egypt and they're going to stay there 400 years. And Abraham is going to be dead when they come out. But God says how you know they're going to come out is this smoking furnace and this burning lamp. This smoking furnace and this burning lamp is a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. It's light on one side and dark on the other side. Somebody ought to help me preach it. When you trust God, your enemies can see you, but they can't get to you. They know you in that thick darkness, but God got you hidden from them. You can see, but they can't. There's another lesson here. There's another lesson here. God said, put the animals facing each other. Make a passageway between the pieces. And you stand right there. Don't you go through the pieces. Now, in the ancient ritual, both men had to pass through the passageway between the pieces. But this ain't two men talking. It's one man and God. Watch this. God says, put the animals facing each other, make a passageway between the pieces, you stay outside and I'm going to walk through by myself. Because the blessings that's coming to you ain't got nothing to do with you. It's all God. I'm making the covenant. You don't even have to keep it. I'm making it. I'm going to keep it. The reason I make it 
It's because I know you can't keep it. And the promises God made in your life, God know you can't live up to the covenant. That's why he told Abram, stay outside. And I'm going to walk through by myself so that you will know that I am is the Lord. I'm through now. But there's one more lesson. God couldn't do it until it got dark. I said God couldn't do it until it got dark. Because there's some things you will never see until it gets dark in your life. There are some miracles that will never happen unless it gets dark in your life. There's some blessings you will never get your hands on unless it gets dark in your life. You will never learn how to really shout until it's been dark in your life and God came and turned the light on and showed you that there are some things that can only happen when life gets dark. I'm trying to close now. But you remember Jacob? Wrestled with an angel. Not during the daytime. But at night. When it got dark. When it got dark, he said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. The angel said, what is your name? He said, my name is Jacob. He said, your name will no longer be Jacob. Your name is going to be Israel. He touched him in his hip and he walked with a limp for the rest of his life as a testimony that he he came out limping but he went home blessed. And the blessing came because God showed up in the darkness. You remember those shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. It was an ordinary night. It was a night like any other night. But then they heard angel music. They heard angels choiring in heaven saying, behold, I bring you Glad tidings of great joy that shall be born to you this day in the city of David, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You'll find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. He didn't bring that news to the king's palace. He didn't send that news to the rich aristocrats. He sent that news to shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. There's some things God is not going to do until it's night in your life. You remember those disciples? They were on the Sea of Galilee and a storm was raging And Jesus was asleep in the bottom of the ship because it was night. And he said, Lord, don't you care that we are about to perish? Jesus got up and waved his hand and said, peace, be still. There was a great calm. It only happened because it was night. You remember Paul and Silas in that Philippian jail. It didn't happen until midnight that God showed up and shook the foundations of that prison and delivered Paul and Silas. But they had to wait until night was in their lives. But that was not the greatest darkness in the scripture. The darkness that Jacob saw was not the greatest darkness. The darkness that the shepherds saw was not the greatest darkness. The darkness that they saw on the Sea of Galilee was not the greatest darkness. The darkness that Paul and Silas was delivered in was not the greatest darkness. 
You want to know what the greatest darkness was for our greatest deliverance. The greatest darkness and the greatest deliverance did not happen at Jacob's Ebenezer. The greatest darkness and the greatest deliverance did not happen in a Philippian jail. The greatest darkness and the greatest deliverance did not happen in a fiery furnace. The greatest darkness and the greatest deliverance didn't happen in a lion's den. The greatest darkness and the greatest deliverance happened one Friday on a hill called Calvary. He died, didn't he die? It got so dark from the sixth to the ninth hour. Is there anybody here had some darkness in your life? Is there anybody here had a storm in your life? Is there anybody here God ever delivered you? Is there anybody here God ever came to your rescue? Is there anybody here didn't know which way to turn and God made a way out of no way? Is there anybody here ever been so depressed you didn't know what the morning was going to bring? But God brought you out in your thick darkness. He made a way out of no way. And here you are in the sunshine of another morning. Tell God, thank you for my darkness. Thank you. There's some things I just can't see until it's dark in my life. If the Lord ever brought you out, why don't you help me tell him thank you. If the Lord ever made a way for you, won't you help me magnify me? If the Lord been good to you and you don't mind praising him, if you know how to shout, I told you just a moment ago, you need to save your shout to show somebody who don't know how to shout how good God has been to you. Tell your neighbor, if you want to know how to shout, watch me, look at me. I'm a testimony. I didn't make it on my own. I'm not standing here all alone. It was Jesus who gave me this opportunity. If the Lord been good to you, why don't you grab somebody? Tell them you don't know like I know what the Lord I know he's all right. He's all right. I know he's all right. I know he's all right. He walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. And the joy. Joy, 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 I know he's all trying to leave it alone I'm trying to quit here there are some things I may not know 
There are some places I can't go But I am sure I wish I had a witness Of this one thing That God is real For I can feel Him in my soul Oh, yes, God is real. He's real in my soul. Yes, God is real. For he has watched. Oh, his love for me. I know I don't deserve it. Is like pure gold. Yes, God is real. Hallelujah. Here's my testimony. Oh, I cannot tell just how you felt. When Jesus took your sin away, hallelujah. But since that day, down in Louisiana where I was born, yes, since that hour, oh, God has been real, for I can feel. His holy power. 